guys and welcome to another episode of the Young Lion Cast with your host Rob Goodwin and I am joined as always by Chris O'Brien. How are you Chris? As always, it's only been two times. I'm fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm alright. It's, it's been a long week. You always just, just fill these podcast intros with such joy. Well, to be fair, when it's me introducing, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I feel like I should at least let you do one intro where you can sing your heart out. I mean, before, I feel like the people need to know that before we came on air, Chris serenaded me with a Sesame Street song. Right, right, okay. So, basically, whenever Rob goes, oh, I'll be ten minutes, there's not a ton you can do in ten minutes. Like... (laughs) Even though you know it's not going to be ten minutes. (laughs) No, I know, but not, like... You know what I mean? Like, I take you at your word, despite uh, fucking running conjecture. But, <laughs> th- like, so basically my only options are either have a game of Tetris or play the guitar. Like, there's, there's a third option, and I'm pretty sure all you filthy-minded fuckers are thinking, but also that's a bit of a danger. So, just, no. Danger wank. <laughs> <laughs> you, d- you, you just, I just, pra- I just press fucking accept. Oh, hi, Rob. Promise me, promise me, you will not answer if you are doing that. I, I don't no, think our friendship fu- can handle that. Why the fuck would I do, oh, really, after Blackville? Well, they're <laughs> stories for another time, another podcast, I feel, Chris. But always <laughs> stories for another time, Rob. Well, ladies and gentlemen, what we're going to do today is a little bit of a new segment that we're going to be doing when there isn't New Japan matches to be covered. Obviously, we are in a bit of a lull between uh, before... King of Pro Wrestling, which obviously takes place next Monday. Um, So what we're going to do is, rather than cover New Japan Road, which nobody cares (laughs) about, um, we are instead going to look at some old Japanese wrestling, because me, as a relative Japanese wrestling noob, will be learning from, in, in comparison, a wrestling veteran in Chris. I'm... I'm I, I'm glad that you said in comparison, because I am by no means a fucking expert on half this shit. Oh, in <laughs> like, comparison I don't know to me, fucking... you are. Yeah, I was about to say, but it's sort of like saying um, my very young nephew is a better walker than Stephen Hawking was. Oh, now then. <laughs> now then. I know, my nephew can't walk yet, he's only five months old. Too soon. Um. Anyway, so what <laughs> it's not you... the worst joke I've ever made. It's, it's really not. We've had to cut ones out of the Podmania podcast. Which... Only once. Yeah, that was a bad one, man. <laughs> Even now, that's still bad, and we won't issue. We won't talk about it again ever. <laughs> but it's my. It's literally my favorite moment in our Podmania because it's just <laughs> a ding comes up and it's just like. Um, so Chris decided to tell a really bad joke, and we can't air it. And I've had to spend a lot of my evening editing out. So thanks, Chris, and to my back to the podcast. And then it's just you, and then it's just me laughing and you and Garth sounding horrified. Yeah, it, it was a moment where my balls shrank back into my body. It was, uh, it was bad times. It was bad times. Um, so anyway, ladies and gentlemen, what we're going to do is we are going to cover three old Japanese matches ranging from... so close to getting him to watch Joshi. So, so close. close. Uh, ranging from mid-90s to all the way through to relative modern day, ranging from companies from New Japan to WAR to All Japan Pro Wrestling. And we will review these matches for you, talk about them, uh, get our freak on to at least two of them, um, <laughs> especially one for me anyway, and then we'll sort of give our ratings and things like that. Before we do that though, Chris, before I get balls deep into some Japanese wrestling, there's a little bit of news. Now, I messaged the Podmania WhatsApp group with absolute horror when it was announced by What Culture Wrestling, I saw it on first, that two potential people leaving from New Japan Pro Wrestling, the first of which is Harold May. Um, now, other sort of sites have sort of refuted this, saying we, they don't know where that's come from and they don't really see why that would happen. But, Chris, your take on the potential departure of Harold May? That's where we're fucking starting. Yes, we are starting there. We're going to leave I, the next one. I, I, barely, I barely know who Harold May is. 
There you go. That's that's good journalistic analysis there, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I, mean, I don't get paid I don't get paid for journalistic analysis. I turn up, tell a few offensive jokes jokes that <laughs> pop the crowd. And then leave. It's what I do. Okay, so you don't give a shit either way then, is what that boils down to. <laughs> yeah, he might leave and New Japan might fall apart and it's like, well fuck. That escalated quickly, but as a stand, nah. Okay. Like the other the other name is a bit more important. Yeah, I to be honest, I threw that in there knowing full well you would not give a shit about this one because you wanted to talk about the one that I'm going to talk about now. Um, unfortunately, the next one is Minoru Suzuki. Um, and it seems a little bit more universally agreed upon that he is unhappy with his position in the company. Um, and I think he's probably been unhappy for a while. It probably didn't help that, obviously, he was booted out of the G1. Um, and then... See, they seem to offer him a title match to appease him being kicked out of the G1 uh, for him then to lose that title match despite absolutely rapturous support from the British fans. And I think the fact that he has been in this company for, you know, God knows how long and still not had a fair crack of the whip at being a champion. Um, Chris, your opinions on this? Is it time for Suzuki to go? Do you think that he's got more to offer? Do you think he's done in New Japan? Well, he sporadically leaves Legat. Like, um, just before this most recent one, he spent a couple of years in Noah. So it's just, he does it. He's always sort of been a freelancer. But, like, yeah, it's a bit shit that he was left out for G1 this year. I kind of get it. Like, with, but, like, they could have chucked out probably Cobb and have Slot Suzuki in rather well. Like, I get why they had Archer in there. But, yeah, it's. It, it, the fact is, he could go to literally any other Japanese promotion and literally be the um, be the top heel. So, I I can see why he'd want to leave. I I'm not happy that he's leaving because like it, literally, if he goes to Noah, I'll probably never see him again. And if he goes to All Japan, I'll only see him if he goes against Kenta Miyahara. So, but like he's such a big figure that he would also bring an audience to. Like pre- like if if you like Suzuki in New Japan, he's probably one of your like top five favorites. So I'm really sad he's going, but I can really see why he is. In your opinion, do you think it is unfair that Suzuki hasn't had a run with the IWGP Heavyweight Championship? Kind of, but also like while he's been back, they've been building up Okada and Omega, so I kind of get why. Like, he's not necessarily uh, prototypical modern day New Japan champion. Like he's not, fa- he's, he's not going to have a fast paced match. Like you can see it in his last match with Okada. He just slaps people about. And but yeah, I think he should have won it. From problem is every, every time where he could have won it, there's bigger stories going on that where, that needed the title. Like the Tana Okada feud needed that title. Mm-hmm. And then when he was up against Okada, it was building up. Well, I say Naito, but then we never put it on fucking him either. But we were trying to build up Okada as the biggest champion of all time. So he definitely deserves a shot of the championship. But in terms of booking, he's never really had a fair crack. And I think him like being an out, mostly a freelancer on and off all the way through, his career hasn't helped. Like You know what New Japan are like? They want... They don't want to put belt, um, at least their main belt on a freelancer. Like, they'll happily put like the IC title or the junior title on him, but they're reluctant to do it on someone who's potentially a flight risk. And historically, Suzuki's a bit of a flight risk. So It was the same issue they had originally with Ibushi. Yeah, until, like, they didn't give Ibushi a major title until they locked him down. Like, the best he ever got was junior. So, this again, I can see why both sides are treated the way they are. And it would explain why Liger and Suzuki isn't happening in Bedell if that if this is the case. I mean, you've you've spoke you've spoken about how obviously Suzuki's always been sort of second fiddle. You've had the Tanahashi and the Okada feud, which lasted for you know two years. You've had Tetsuya Naito constantly on the brink. Then you had Okada versus Omega. And now you've got the Okada, Jay White, Naito, Ibushi sort of quadrangle. Now, do you think that Suzuki is just a victim 
of his timing because you look at the mid noughties and you look at who was champion in the mid noughties. You've got Satoshi Kojima, you've got Hiroshi Tenzan, you've got Manabu Nakanishi, you've got Yuji Nagata. All those people had a run with the IWGP Heavyweight Championship. Now, from my perspective, someone who has been watching New Japan for a little over two years, New Japan aren't want to put their belt on anyone a la WWE. You know, Jinder Mahal, for example. You, they don't just put the belt well, on anyone. <laughs> they don't put the belt on anyone. They have to have a storyline in place. There has to be a reason behind everything they do. And do you think Suzuki has just been a victim of his time? And if he'd have been wrestling in the mid noughties in that time where, you know, that unfortunately New Japan sort of fell off the face of the earth a little bit, do you think he'd have been better suited then? Okay, it's straight. Okay, I mean, first of all, not an ex. Mid two thousands is definitely sort of my blank spot in terms of New Japan because most of it is enough from fucking world. Like all of Brock Lesnar's run is among the world. But anyway, um, yeah, it's weird because like the best time for Suzuki, where they'd probably give him a proper run, is like that mid two thousands block, like where they really like with no him and being really MMA inspired, where he where he lost like Shiny, Shinya Hashimoto because he actually had a judo champion fucking shoot on him. In the Tokyo Dome, that was ridiculous. But yeah, um, that would have been the perfect time. But also, if Suzuki had went to New Japan at that point, he wouldn't have fucking got anywhere. Like, he might have been champion, but he'd be champion of a fucking sinking ship. So he was in Noah at the time, which was the perfect place. And also, all Japan, um, where he even there, he was sort of making more money. It's, it's I don't know. I, I think where he, he doesn't, isn't quite a top guy wherever he goes. I really don't know how to answer your question because I think maybe if he was consistent in the 2000s, he would have won the IWGP Championship. But like at that point, who really cared? Yeah, true. Scott Norton won it, for God's sake. Uh, no, that was, that was more of the 90s. Bob Sapp is the big fucking issue. And also Lesnar's run. Did you hear what Lesnar did to the fucking bell? Um, he held it hostage. Ultimate Warrior and- style. Yeah, basically. Um, they hadn't paid him yet. And he and they were like, oh, can we have the belt for cleaning? And he was like, nah, I think I can clean it on my own. And so then he fucked off from New Japan with the belt. Problem was, um, they had retired the old IWGP belt um, to in honor of Shinya Hashimoto and then had to bring that back because Lesnar wouldn't mail the belt back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brought Lesnar. Brock Lesnar, what a legend. such a cunt. <laughs> Just never plays ball. Um, again, it's it's purely speculation at the moment that Minoru Suzuki is leaving. He might well sign a contract. He might well go to Pro Wrestling Noah, AEW, All Japan. Who knows? If you had, I'd to- hate to see him in AEW for the record. Like, I don't the the style of the company goes for. He would not fit in at all. If you were a betting man, Chris. Where's he going? Noah. I think he fits in best currently with Noah, and I think they're drawing more than odd. He's probably going to go to the next biggest drawing um, promotion, but have him like it's not like he can turn up in stardom and start slapping fucking Mayo about. Although I think Garth would like that anyway. Um, or like <laughs> Dragon Gate where it's all junior wrestling. So, but like he. he it's even all, all Japan. Personally, I want to see more in all Japan because I know more about all Japan. Mm. But if I was betting, Noah is sort of in a resurgence right now. They're, they're treating veterans quite good, like um, Marafuji and Muto are going after at the next big event. So, And don't forget, obviously, that Noah are just bringing in their secondary men's title as well. Are they? I, they I, are. I know nothing about Noah. So. Um, I believe, and I'm sure someone will correct me in the comments, but I'm sure it's called the GHC national title. And can we, I believe it is have... Elgin and someone taking. Uh... Oh, that's the Elgin match. Okay. Yes, I'm sure it is. Just let me, uh, just let me quickly check that. But with a second you time. Intermission, diddly, diddly. Um, um, yeah. It's one to be fair, Suzuki. Go on, keep going. Um, Noah's current champion has held it for a while, hasn't he? Um, Kiyomaya. I'll, yes. dub- I'll double. Yeah. Yes, he has. He's so, held it for quite I a think, long time. 
I think Suzuki coming in and Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this. this is big. Really... I don't know what this means for Suzuki. I'm, I'm quite worried what this means for Suzuki. Well, that was going to be my next question. Um, yeah, it says the GHC national title and it is Michael Elgin versus Takashi Sugiura. It's quite bad because Noah's sort of re- reverting to New Japan now because they've changed their annual tournament name to the N1. <laughs> to the N1, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> As for Suzuki Gun, I mean, if I, if I personally... I mean, it was called Kojima Gun before. If I had to choose a person to take over from Suzuki, for me, there's only one real option, and that's Tai Chi. Tai Chi. <laughs> Realistically, I know that we mock Tai Chi quite a lot. I know that we say, you know... No, you mock Tai Chi a lot. Okay, I mock Tai Chi quite a lot, but Zack Sabre Jr. doesn't strike me as a leader, and he's the only one, really, who would take that on. Archer doesn't strike me as a leader. He strikes me as a dominant monster. For me, Tai Chi is... I mean, t- Tai Chi Goon? It doesn't quite sound right. Fair, but... Suzuki Didn't Suzuki win at Okajima as an outsider of Goon? So, Goon, it's, just, it's all fucking not meant for the English language. But, um, <laughs> so, why wouldn't some... Like, I wouldn't be surprised if we had someone from outside Suzuki Gun win. Um, like beat Suzuki and take over Suzuki Gun. It's not like Bullet Club who have like loads of cues. It's always from outside that's taken over rather than the inside. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. Um, but like, who would you have to take it over from the outside? Now that I think about it, um... Kojima could take it back. It'd probably be a bit shit, wouldn't it? I think if Kenta hadn't already aligned himself with Bullet Club, I think he'd have Bullet been good. Bullet Club, yeah. Um, Shibata. <laughs> Shibata. Oh wow. That's a big... I mean, he's got to be cleared for wrestling first. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good point. What um, about... Maybe bring it... What about a heel turn? Hiroki Goto. Goto gun? Ah, to be fair, Goto's been wrestling like he's in Suzuki gun recently. <laughs> We've been saying that, so, haven't we? Because he keeps throwing young boys at people. That's a Suzuki gun. <laughs> yes, he did. He did. Um, I mean... Oh, Ishii? <laughs> Ishii got, to be fair that's probably the only time that Ishii's gonna if Ishii did that he can actually properly have an honest god run of the title so I'd be down for that yeah exactly but also like it's very hard to hate Ishii but again it's very hard to hate Suzuki despite how fucking scared I am of him you know what? how scared I am of Suzuki he posts um, pictures of his socks on Instagram and I don't trust it no no and something I know what you mean something sinister is going on something sinister is going on disguised like as wave. something good there's a razor blade in those socks or something. <laughs> like, I don't trust it. Uh, this has been quite a nice transition, actually, because our first match is for the Never Open Weight Championship. And Minoru Suzuki, as it stands, um, is the second longest reigning Never Open Weight Champion. Hmm. Uh, having won the belt once um, in 2017, he held the belt for 252 days. Um, in four title defences before losing it to Hiroki Goto at Wrestle Kingdom 12 in an absolutely amazing match. That was, it's probably Goto's best ever match. No, uh, no yeah. I wouldn't say it's his best ever, it's definitely his top three. Yeah. Definitely. Um, but the reason this segues quite well into our first match is because our first match takes place at the new beginning in Sendai. Um, and it was for the Never Open Weight Championship, the vacant Never Open Weight Championship, because at Wrestle Kingdom 9, which you can listen to in the archives, um, Togi Makabe defeated Tomohiro Ishii for the championship in, again, an absolutely amazing match. Uh, unfortunately, um, on Valentine's Day 2015, what a shit time for Makabe, um, he had to vacate that title because he had influenza. I'm sorry, but I'm sort of laughing now because it's sort of like, good news, Maccabee, you're getting laid tonight. Bad news, you have influenza, so you're not getting laid tonight and also give us your title. <laughs> you should have just done a Brock Lesnar and say, no, I can clean it. <laughs> um, but this, of course, led to an Ishii versus Tomaki Homma match at the New Beginning event in Sandai. Now, at this point, Tomaki Homma is a lovable underdog. Shit! But everybody <laughs> loves him. Could not win a match. He's an entertainer. He, he was. He was an entertainer. Yet his win-loss record was absolutely abhorrent. 
I'm very um, curious what his current win loss record is. I'm going to search this up. Okay, well, I will continue whilst you do that. Please let me know. Um, at this point, nobody really took Homma seriously, least of all Ishii, and that is why this match was as hot as it was. The crowd support for Homma, especially as he comes to the ring, is absolutely amazing. Now, I watched this on New Japan World. I know, Chris, you watched it on Daily Motion. Um, on the New Japan World, it is the only Don't time... Don't tell me a pirate. <laughs> it is the only time I've heard Ishii's music copyrighted. Ever. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? Oh, by the way, his current win-loss record in New Japan is 411 losses. Um, wins. Sorry, 300... Fuck. 411 wins, three draws, and 625 losses. It's not great, is it? Let's be honest. No, that's including like tag matches. So it's not even like if he's in a tag team like Maccabe, and Maccabe picks up the win, that counts. So, well, um, this match then, Chris, you recommended this to me when I posted on Twitter and Facebook. What great Japanese wrestling matches should I be watching? You instantly said this. Why were you watching at this point? Um. Yeah, because it's after Wrestle Kingdom 9. I watched this one month after the fact, though, because there was no, like, really reliable way to get New Japan stuff, but you didn't have to pay up the fucking wazoo for. Like, New Japan World wasn't a thing at this point, or at least if it was, I wasn't aware of it. So, like, I watched this months later and sort of shit myself when I watched it. <laughs> now, this is the only match I've actually seen where Tommy, uh, Tomoaki Homa, aside from... um a match at Wrestle Kingdom 8, I believe. No, Wrestle Kingdom 10, I'm sorry. Um, this is the only match that I've actually watched where Homma is capable of A, taking a bump, and B, going at a pace, because obviously after the horrendous inju- injury he he got in 2017, I believe, at the hands of Giardo. Um, yeah. This is the only match I've seen where he can go, and I was really, really impressed. It was literally an extension of the Ishii Makabe match from Wrestle Kingdom 9, just beating oh, exactly. the living piss out of each other. Yeah, exactly. This is what I want whenever Open Witch Tower to be, and it's just not been that, and it's a shame. Apart from now with Kendra, it kind of is that, but you know. Yeah. Um. Again, le- legitimate wrestling moves, there weren't many. No, there was basically brain busters. That's basically. There was Brainbusters. Tom Homer ended up busted open. The first half of this match was him trying to hit the Kokeshi and failing repeatedly. Oh, it was quite, it was quite sad actually. And the fact, worst bit about the Kokeshi, he doesn't. It's not like a um, Dynamite Kid one where he's at least putting his arms out, so you could at least kid yourself that he's like putting his arms down slightly before his head hits the mat. He's just throwing his fucking head at the mat. Speaking of the Kokeshi, there is a sickening spot where Ishii is on the mat outside and Honma ascends to the top rope and hits a Kokeshi onto the outside. Now, that doesn't sound terrifying. Go and look at the bump because especially knowing Honma's now dodgy neck, watching him come off the top rope with literally no hand support whatsoever and basically landing stomach first and head first onto Ishii is just, it's a horrible, horrible bump. And it's New Japan mats, which aren't really mats. They're, basic, they're basically rugs. He fell onto a rug. He did, and he took it like an absolute champ. He was straight up, but good God, I never, ever, ever want to see that spot again. Dives to the outside, fine. Stuff like that, fuck no. Absolutely not. Something else I noticed in this match was Ishii's headbutts have always been a staple of his matches, yet recently he seems to have pulled back a little bit with his headbutts. Now, in this match, they were very stiff headbutts and they looked real. Now, do we assume that after the horrendous injury to Shibata, other wrestlers sort of toned it back a little bit in regard to the headbutts. Because here, Ishii fucking wasn't. I wouldn't be surprised if it was like a company Monday after Shibata. Just don't fucking do it. Like, yeah, I'm, I'd be curious to see if we, watch, if we watch like an Ishii match later on after Shibata and see if it is just that. Comparing actually... it to his G1 run, I would argue that Ishii's headbutts are not tame by any stretch of the imagination. But obviously, <laughs> headbutts the shoulder and sort of the clavicle yeah. region as opposed to the head of the other person. And so it's more like his last three G1 
run. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, I, I, you, if you can see what I mean. And obviously, I think that is an absolutely perfect thing to do, obviously. Um, there were so many times that Homer could have won this, and I was convinced that Homer was going to win no, this. There are points in this match where you want Homer to win, Mormon is sex addict, wants to get his hole. It's ridiculous. <laughs> you so want Homer to go over. And in your heart, you know that Ishii is going to win. Ishii is a champion. You know he's a champion. Homer is that lovable loser that just doesn't quite get there. And unfortunately, that is the case here. Ishii hitting the vertical brain buster at 24 minutes and 46 to get the vacant never open weight championship. I gave this, Chris, a nine. I absolutely loved this match. I loved the stiffness of it. I loved the pacing of it. I loved the very different parts of the match. Like I say, the first part of the match is Homer trying to hit the Kokeshi. The second part is Ishii dominance. And then the stretch at the end, which, you know, we have Homer's almost chance spots at trying to win the match. I loved it. Yeah, it's I love the story of um Homna is not a good he's not a good fighter. But he'll fucking throw himself at you. And do that that's also why he's a good worker is like he's not actually a good worker but he'll fucking die for you there was... Do you think, i think that he's a deathmatch wrestler originally isn't he i believe so yes i believe that's where his background is so to be fair that's how um kevin kelly introduces him in fucking the recount or whatever so that would make sense um but yeah because like nothing in this match was pretty like at all no and there was this there was a chop off at one point and like you know me, Rob, give me a good chop, and I'm into your match. And just Jesus Christ, there's a super brain buster, not a superplex, super brain buster. Where he dropped, I'm pretty sure he dropped Homer right on the right on of his, his head. head. Yeah, and fucking do that. I also Homer's sort of um, reverse tombstone, not reverse tombstone, um, like reverse power drive. Yeah, reverse power driver, like in tombstone position, sit out. Like, an Ishii just, like, there's nowhere for Ishii to go, but also he can't break Ishii's neck because he doesn't have one, so that's one good thing. He doesn't, or he started with one, and it's just been that compressed until eventually he's, it just goes shoulders head. <laughs> um, that would make sense. So, do you agree nine? I agree nine. Um, I'm pretty sure I've had a watch, watch this closer to the time. At the time, I'd be arguing very passionately for a ten. Oh, yes. But as it's... But as it sort of stands in hindsight, especially given where we know Homner's ended up, it's, it's a very difficult watch at points. So I disagree with a nine. It is. Uh, Meltzer gave this five stars. Cage match rates it 9.34. It is the standout of this card. This, of course, what is a card. Is on this card. Well, let me tell you now, Chris. There is an NWA World Heavyweight Championship match. Oh, fuck, I forgot that. Where Hirio Tenzan defeats Rob, Conway? Rob fucking Conway. Conway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Conway's had a match with Okada. Just unbelievable. The man with the worst WWF theme music. If you haven't heard just it, listen to it. Just look at me. Just look I, at I, me. I love it. It's like Randy Newman wrote it. It's atrocious. It is absolutely okay. awful. So, Rob Conway hasn't won against Okada by the looks of it, but he has won against Tanner, I think. He's also won against Liger. Yeah, but was that TNA? No, 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 this is New Japan. Oh, wow. Okay. Rob Conway this... been booked strong. Conway no, wins low. Um, New Japan Big and Conway. the NW... <laughs> New Japan and the NWA had a um, relationship at one point. Well, on this and card actually, as that's well. Where, that's where Chase Owens came from. He was... Well, again, this is where we have an NWA World T Junior heavyweight title match with Jushin Liger, who is the champion, defeating Chase Owens. Liger was champion as recent as this. Uh, yes, 2015, he was the NWA World Junior Heavyweight Champion. And there was talk, of course, of originally at Wrestle Kingdom 9, him fighting Tiger Mask for the belt. I'd have been fucking atrocious. Well, it is 2015, it might not have been. Tiger Mask. Tiger Mask has never been good. That is true. As long as I've been watching. Oh, but Tiger Mask 4, we should stress. The other three Tiger Masks are just fine. Although, I'm looking at... Um, Rob Conway did um, appear on a Wrestle Kingdom, now that I'm looking at it. Was it Wrestle Kingdom 2 where every fucker turned up? 
No, it was Wrestle Kingdom 8. This is after New Japan got standards. Oh, right. <laughs> it was probably singles match for the NWA Championship. Kojima beat Conway. Jesus, he did not enjoy taking on Tenkozy, did he? No. <laughs> and, and trying to, and to be fair, the Wrestle Kingdom 8 is very much a mixed bag. Because while you have amazing things like Goto and Shibata and Okada versus Naito and Tanahashi versus Nakamura, you also have Muta teaming with Yana against Shelton Benjamin and Minoru Suzuki. Oh. Um, fucking Sakuraba and Nagata versus Daniel Gracie and Rolls Gracie versus more and, and also Bullet Club versus Kill Elite Squad before Lance Archer became the best thing in New Japan. Oh, God. Uh, main event of this show, just quickly, was the IWGP Intercontinental Championship match between Shinsuke Nakamura and Yuji Nagata, which obviously Nakamura retains. So, first match, one excellent sh- excellent match, just literally beating the shit out of each other. I thought that would be the stiffest thing I saw all day. <laughs> and then... Good God. <laughs> how wrong Fucking, I was. To be fair, you were originally, instead of um, this, going to do Jungle Kiona versus Arissa, um, I, can't, I, can't, I forgot a second name, at uh, Stardom X Stardom this year. Um, yeah. And that wouldn't that wouldn't have been the stiffest thing you ever saw. Although, comparatively, because they're just sort of so tiny, you're like, oh, fuck, stop hurting each other. Let me give you <laughs> yeah. a little bit of context to this, ladies and gentlemen. Basically, Chris gave me five options to watch to review for this show. And I, my third option was originally going to be Stardom X Stardom. And I decided partway through, do you know what? I want some All Japan in my life. And Jesus Christ. The match I'm talking about took place at the Summer Action Series 1993 Night 22 on the 29th of July 1993 at Budokan Hall. Uh, it is a singles match and it was Stan Hansen taking on Kenta Kabashi. Now, I am just going to quickly give you a couple of facts. For a start, it is a five-star rated match in the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. It is 9.36 rated on Cage Match. It is a Stan Hansen match, therefore <laughs> everything hurts. Everything hurts. And good God... How is Kenta Kabashi alive after oh, this match? Um, so, I'm a weird guy. And sometimes... Really? Yeah. <laughs> no, sometimes <laughs> when I'm playing Smash Brothers with my niece, if I do something, if I hit them really hard, I'll just shout, Lolly asshole! So my niece knows nothing about wrestling, apart from <laughs> Bailey, But <laughs> she knows the Lolly Do you know what? Does she need to know anything else? To be... One day I'll sit her down and show her a Stan Hansen match and she'll shit her pants. Why do that to the poor girl? <laughs> oh, no, this will be her 10th birthday. Okay, I'm not going to lie. If you're going to show this match to a 10-year-old girl, you are literally the work of Satan. This match, uh, I mean... am nearly 30 years old, Chris, <laughs> and this match scared the living shit out of me. <laughs> to be fair, she'd probably get bored. She doesn't... She. She likes horror movies, and she's seven. Speaking of horror movies, <laughs> this match was 22 minutes and 35 seconds of absolute carnage. Stan this Hansen is, even... is basically, for those who haven't seen him, he's JBL if JBL had a temper. He's JBL <laughs> if JBL drank every night 14 pints of bitter. Okay, Stan is, Hansen this... is JBL if JBL stabbed you in the heart with a knife. Stan okay. Hansen is a terrifying human being. If Stan Hansen uh, is JBL's northern equivalent. <laughs> yes, pretty much. He is enormous. He has a beer belly, which makes it so much more terrifying for some reason. He looks a bit like my granddad. <laughs> He, I think he looks like everyone's granddad. He looks like he'd be a genuine good guy to go out for a pint with. But as soon as he went over that three I'm... pint limit, he'd want to fight everyone. Actually, I found out about a northern. Well, I don't know if it's a northern tradition, but like a tradition my granddad had with um, his mate, his engineering mates, where they'd have session beers, which is like um, beer, like milk beers, 
like um, Bellhaven Best or Guinness Milk Stout. Because um, but while we'd still get drunk, they'd feel bloated before the point where we get drunk to, to the point of having a hangover the next day. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay, fair enough. Why not? I imagine Stan Hansen did that as well, to be fair. No, uh, no I'm, I imagine Stan Hansen drank, um, drank a bottle of whiskey and then um, for pre drinks. Yeah, he's that kind of man. Anyway, so, enough, of, he, enough of that. Enough of, like, stroking his cock, because I don't think he'd approve. By the way, Stan Hansen does seem like a genuinely lovely guy. In real life, absolutely. Uh, like, have you seen his Hall of Fame speech? He's fucking lovely. I'm sure in real life, Stan Hansen is an absolutely beautiful I remember, man. I remember seeing him, like, this is like WrestleMania 29 or something. This is when Sam Martino was already in, and I was watching it, not not having seen any of this. Thinking, oh, what a lovely, what a lovely man. I really want to give him a hug. Not anymore. Absolutely Jesus Christ. not. He will headbutt your head off of your shoulders. <laughs> okay, let's just get into this match. By the way, this match starts with a DDT on the floor, just to... Just to highlight how stiff this match is. Literally instantly. Um, Literally, like 30 seconds into this match. Normally when people go outside at the beginning of a match, it's because they're trying to pad it out. Not these two. Oh, no. <laughs> Stan Hansen was in the crowd within, what, 40, 50 seconds? Yeah, and like not as a stalling tactic. He just got fucking thrown there. Never. I mean, we spoke in the previous match, the Ishii versus Homma match, we spoke about how there was little re- there were little wrestling moves. It was literally a slugfest. This took that to an all new level. An all I mean, Stan Hansen perhaps performed five moves. No, Stan Hansen spent a lot of this on his back, but it's fought back from it. It's really because you like you can tell Stan Hansen isn't a disciplined fighter when you see him fight. Let's put it this way. He pulled absolutely no moves here. Yeah, he basically had. It's weird because Dan Hansen's known for like throwing laliatos next and right. I can't just say lariats anymore. Can you please um, do it properly? Laliato! <laughs> <laughs> Outstanding. So, like, so he didn't throw one until the end. It was, Ka- it was Kabashi throwing. <laughs> And, like, it speaks volumes how much of an MVP Hansen was in this match that we haven't even mentioned. Kabashi, you know, one of the best of all time. It's because Kabashi got nothing in. No, neither all. man got anything in. How the fuck is this such a good match? And neither of these men fucking did anything. Literally, it was Stan Hansen just trying to hurt Kabashi. And I need to talk about this move because, honestly, <laughs> oh, I mean, whenever I hate mention this but in WWE whenever they rip the matting up there's always like a oh will he won't he oh god you know and is he going to take the does. bump yeah and then there's always like a really not a timid bump because I imagine on a concrete it, everything it, would it, hurt it's how it's how, how I put someone down when I'm play wrestling with my younger relatives exactly this Stan Hansen <laughs> ripped up Christ. the matting and full on power bombed Kabashi without any how, sort how? of protection Right onto the concrete. No, I fucking ah. To be fair, there's another match these guys had in 1991, and fucking fuck, one of their knees. I forget who it was. One of their knees just went right fucking onto the railing, and I thought that couldn't get any worse. Jesus fucking Christ! I'm not joking here. It wasn't even a cushioned power bomb. It was a jackknife no. power bomb, which basically Kanta Kabashi came flying off the top of Hansen and then hit the concrete. There was no control whatsoever, which sort of plays into what you were saying about Hansen not being a disciplined fighter. Oh, my God. <laughs> Kanta Kabashi got thrown onto the floor like you throw your keys onto the kitchen counter when you walk in after a long day at work. It was very... Very uncomfortable. Like you think some of the you think um the guys in New Japan work stiff or Walter works stiff or Ulya Dragunov works stiff or JBL works stiff. This isn't stiff. This is abuse. This is a legitimate fight. Like honestly, I'm not joking. His knees to the head of Kabashi were legitimate. I'm going to hurt no, you knees. It was, it was a good. St- like, I should quickly say, but this, it, this match was more of an abuse. There was a good running story where um when Kabashi was on. Um, offense, he went really fast because if they slow down, Hansen can knock out Kabashi in one blow. Like, and then when Hansen was in control, Hansen would walk around. He doesn't want to expand the energy in case Kabashi gets back on top. 
because um, he might as well while he's in control. Because he knows like one punch is as good as like ten of Kabashis. Yeah. So he's just going to take his time and fucking destroy him. Although, you know what weird bit of a match um, that really worried me? And it's because I know what happens to Kabashi later in life. Go on. Was the machine gun chops. G- Honestly, Kojima's chops now look even more ridiculous. I know. Just honestly, the rapid... Fu- I can't move my hand that quickly. I'm doing it now. You can't see me because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm it's a podcast. Re- like, hang on. I'm, gonna, I'm right next to the wall. I'm going to see if I can do it that fast. Go on, then. No. Hang I'm on. Let me try. Hurt. Let me try. But honestly, I'm doing How that so... How confused is your girl? How confused is your girl? <laughs> honestly, I think, I think the fact I do a wrestling podcast confuses her enough, to be perfectly honest. Didn't you force her to wear a fucking Bray Wyatt shirt the other day? I didn't force her to wear a Bray Wyatt shirt. She just wore the Bray Wyatt shirt. <laughs> <laughs> it was the shirt I go to the gym in. <laughs> shamelessly. Um, shamelessly. Fucking shameless. Anyway, to be fair, wrestling, the gym is basically the only place you can get away with a wrestling top in everyday life. I mean, I just wear them in everyday life because they're not even the most embarrassing shirts I own. But, um, <laughs> like, I walk I walk around a lot of days in a fucking Junior. Um, no, no Gallagher's High Flying Bird shirt, and people look at me. Actually, I, once, I wore it to a Liam Gallagher gig at Transmit, and people just, literally a guy walked past me, and, you're fucking brave, pal, wearing that here. Fucking, <laughs> That's all right. such a threat. <laughs> It's like, you're fucking brave, pal. I'm like, oh, I just stood next to my brother for the rest of the time. It's like, make sure no one gets me for wearing a no Gallagher t-shirt. Anyway. <laughs> make sure no one gets me. <laughs> it's like, weird, because I'm big of it. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the biggest one in my family. So Anyway, we got off, we got really off. So, yeah, so that rapid fire chop, because he kept doing them, he had to get emergency surgery on both arms oh later in God. life. Like, near the end of um, Kabashi's career, he got, like, um, emergency arm surgery, two bouts with cancer. The man's um, a machine. Kidney, kidney issue. I know, fucking, he kicked cancer's ass. He did, fucking, fair play to him. And, uh, it's, it's bad, because, like, there's only one real, like, tragic end with, it's weird, considering who was wrestling, um, how these people wrestled, but, like, the only real tragic end in, like, the king, night of the 90s King Road stuff is fucking Masawa. And that's because he kept going long after he had to. Yeah, I no, I agree. This match, genuinely though, could have resulted in a death. Oh, fuck. You know, I'll ask, was um, Stan Hansen's dive? Did he just fucking, he literally just fucking jumped on him. Yes, <laughs> there was there was no control there, and again, he performed another power bomb in the ring, and there was no control, and then just sort of fell on him as this pinfall, and it looked like, oh my god, he's actually killed Kabashi. Um, Kabashi's um, moon salts though weren't the prettiest things in the world, but they looked but they, amazing. No, because they looked like they fucking hurt. <laughs> they looked like they hurt. They looked like he was exhausted and beaten up, which was perfect. And mm-hmm. he got the win. Obviously, he hit one moonsault, Hansen kicked out, got straight up, went straight to the ring post and did another one. Why do more wrestlers not do that? Oh, you kicked out my finisher. Right, I'm going to hit you with another one and then pin you again. Sonata, Sonata does it. Well, Sonata does it, yeah. But, I mean... Surely that's wrestling 101. You kicked out of a finisher, right? I'm going to hit you with another one. I don't know how, if we somehow watch different matches here, but my, um, the 1993 one I watched, fucking Hansen went over. Oh. In my match, we Kenta Kabashi different... went over. We have, we have accidentally watched different matches, but somehow the same things have happened. This is incredible. Holy fuck. <laughs> my one, he won after a top row fucking lariat. In mine, Kabashi won after two moonsaults. And they're both from... They're bro- both Summer Action Series, 29th of the 7th. Yeah. No, yeah, mine was July 99th. Yeah. <laughs> How the fuck did this happen? I don't understand. I'll, for- I'll, I'll message you mine. I'll forward you mine. Anyway, basically, what we're trying to say here... This is amazing. What we're trying to say here... Just go and watch any Stan Hansen Kenta Kabashi match because they're all stiff as fuck. They all hurt, and no matter who wins and how they win, it's incredible. Um, I need, did you also have the DDT on the floor? Yes, after like twenty seconds. Yeah. What the fuck? What the fuck is happening? I do not understand this. Have I? Uh, the only explanation is somehow halfway through we accidentally clicked clicked on a different video, but like. This makes no... Because did yours also have like, a dive from the apron by Hansen? 
Hang on one second. Where is my phone? I am going to check which one I watched because mine July was on 29th, YouTube. July 1993. Right. Well, it, mine obviously wasn't that one because in mine, Kenta Kabashi went over. So that one, I'm obviously watched the wrong one, but I'm intrigued to know when it... Right. Here we go. This was the one I watched. Are you sending it to me? No. July 29th, 1993, it says. Yeah. What the fuck? No, my Hansen went over in mine. Oh, hang on. <laughs> in the description, it says AGPW, Stan Hansen versus Kenta Kabashi, July 29, 1993. Yeah. And then underneath that, it says Triple Crown Championship match, Kenta Kabashi versus Stan Hansen, September 5th, 1996. Oh, my, mine doesn't say, say, I don't know what the fuck's happened. The, my, yours must be fucking spliced then. Oh, mine's a spliced match. So I've got both, and I've only watched the first one. <laughs> why would it... Why? Ha, but we have the same spots. This is such an anomaly. I don't understand why you would splice two videos together, but then not put both videos in the description. <laughs> That's weird. That's really weird. I don't understand. Right. Anyway, sorry, ladies and gentlemen, but you've got two matches for the price of one there, so you should count yourselves very, very <laughs> But we, But we split about the same thing. This is... So weird. But yeah, I'm going to make you watch either another... For the next time we do this, I'll make you watch either another Kabashi or Stan... Actually, I'm too fair. I think we, Stan Hansen is, most, is going to be a running theme because I kind of want to make you suffer. Oh, no, I love Stan Hansen's matches. Oh, fucking... I know, like, you thought... Like, you can see where Walter gets it from. No one wrestles like Stan Hansen. No one at all. But when you look at my personal favourite New Japan matches are Suzuki versus Ishii, Suzuki versus Goto, um... I mean, in the G1, you had to, uh, Shingo versus Ishii. You know, those yeah, so hard big hitting man pounding it. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, the match I probably liked most on the Destruction Tour, aside from Pommy, Jay White, and Naito, was Shingo versus Goto. Two of them, we need to watch some Vader matches. Oh, I do want to watch some Vader matches when he's not being abysmally underused in the WWE. Yeah, also. Um, we could watch the Hanson Vader match where Hanson pops Vader's eye out because that's a right. new Japan one. What year is that? Because I'll end up watching the wrong fucking one. <laughs> right, I'll tell you what, from now on, when we're doing these, I'll fucking link you. <laughs> Would you mind? Would you no. mind terribly? Yeah, because fucking, to be fair, if it's New Japan, I'll just point you to fucking Larry Atos and then tell you the year. But like, if it's on YouTube from now on, I'm not trusting you. <laughs> that's, 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 that's That's fair. It's the fucking first result when you search Hanson and Kenta Gabashi as well. I don't know how the fuck you've done this, but anyway. I just typed it, I typed it into YouTube, it came up, and it said, I've just told you what it said. In fact, do you know what? Because I know Chris doesn't believe me. I am going to forward him the link just to prove that this is definitely the one. In fact, it's got one dislike, which probably is one person going, this isn't the right fucking match. What are you doing? I see, see mine has six dislikes, so we were, <laughs> watching different, we were definitely watching different videos. Right, I've sent it to the... I've sent it to the WhatsApp group, which means Sorry, Garth's going to be you're like, what the fuck is you're basically he doing? Can get... <laughs> That's still Garth to watch it, because he loves Dana. Oh, fucking yeah. All right. Yeah, okay. Can you fucking... now see why? Yeah. You've... You... <laughs> yeah, for fuck's sake. Did it... What, and, what I think's happened here, you ser- you searched it up, saw two, one that's 20 minutes, one that's 40, and you know that new other old fan matches went really fucking long, so you picked the longer one, assuming that's the right one. But again, it's two matches spliced into one, because it's in the middle. It yeah. didn't, go, didn't last the video, so I assumed the first one, I was like, oh, must have just put the video on again. Um. Uh, anyway, that's by the by. Two very, very, very stiff, I'm going to beat the living shit out of your matches. We decided we needed a little bit of a palate cleanser, and that palate cleanser came in the way of the Super J Cup. The Super J Cup 1995, the first semi-final from the 13th of December between Jushin Thunder Liger and Ultimo Dragon, with WAR being the yeah. wrestling promotion. Do you, know what w- do you know what WAR stands for? I do indeed, because I researched it for this, because I was going to ask you the very same question. Rest. Wrestling and Romance. Well, it was formally known as Wrestle and Romance. It was officially known as Wrestle Association R, which... Oh, that's, that's shit. I, I prefer Wrestle and Romance, and to romance, be perfectly yeah. honest. Because that's something, that's something Vince wants. That's a name that Vince wants for one of his shit. <laughs> <laughs> WWE Wrestling and Romance. Are we going to tell people the story about how you also had trouble finding this one? Um, Yeah, please do. Um, 
Rob messaged me going, I'm on New Japan World. I can't fucking find this um, J-Cup match for the life of me. I'm like, you do know they used to swap the J-Cup around, right? I had no idea. Turns out 2000 was uh, held by Michinoku Pro. But yeah, it's, um, there we go. It's more, it's more of Liger's um, thing than yeah. um, New Japan's. Um, um, New Japan does have inherited it because that's where Liger is. Although, there are some fucking great names in this field. There were some fantastic ones. Absolutely Funaki. fantastic ones. Funaki, <laughs> Funaki, yeah, absolutely. Rey Mysterio was in a showcase match. He wasn't in yeah, the tournament. Yeah, Psychosis. Uh, psychosis. Um, Gato, Wild Pegasus. Um, Ultimate Dragon, obviously. Lionheart. As in Jericho, Lionheart. Yeah. Not, like, not ICW Lionheart. Although, um, it's not quite as stacked as 94 J-Cup, but then again, I think most of them were signed up by um, WCW at that point, so that makes sense. To be perfectly honest, overall, you know, having read reviews and done some research on the background of the tournament, this, though it got relatively positive reviews, the main thing that held the Super J Cup 1995 back in relation to the predecessor was the fact that Gado got to the final. <laughs> You're not saying on Gado. Gado's a decent... He's a, good, he's a good hand, great tag wrestler. But he shouldn't go to the... Back. Final of someone like this, especially since that, I think I'm pretty sure I'm right in saying they're two new Japan talent, um, and that's not what the J Cup's about. That's what's doomed for 2016 J Cup. No, Gator was wrestling for Wrestle Association R at that point. Ah, okay, all right, because fucking okay, that's fine then. Because um, the 2016 J Cup was basically doomed because only Bushi Road talent, so Noah and New Japan got through the first round. So. I just want to point out that in the semi-final, Gado defeated Wild Pegasus. So the winner of the last shake-up as well. Yeah, so just bear that in mind. Um, it's so it's such a weird thing. Anyway, this entire this entire show was it was weird. awesome, awesome. I mean, I've watched highlights of a couple of the other matches. Um, like the show shows on YouTube, if you ever bored. Yeah, it is. It's a it's a good show overall. The and Psychosis is great, but not, it's not as good as the ECW stuff. But it's still great. No, and I know that Meltzer gave something five stars, but I can't remember off the top of my head what match he gave five stars to. Um, if you bear with me, I'll find it's out. Nice. Um, Pegasus versus Sasuke. That makes sense. Um, um, to be fair, I really like. Oh no, that was this... that was nineteen ninety four. No, oh, right, fucking... Yeah, that makes sense, because Suzuki's not even... Fuck's sake. No, also, Sasuke's it... not even in this. Yeah, I like how it's going between Suzuki and Sasuke, just so no one murdered us. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this match, Chris. Why did yes. you choose this match? What happened? <laughs> Talk to me. Okay, basically... Um, so, like, very quickly, so the five matches I gave Rob the choice of were these three... Stardom X Stardom, and then Ibushi versus the blow-up doll. And um, Rob didn't go for the blow-up doll for some reason. And I basically I got halfway down the list realised, oh, two, a lot of these are basically um, people beating shit out of each other. We need something a bit pretty. So I went for this. And God, this was pretty. It was a very pretty match. Liger is a very pretty man under his... I don't know what he looks like. I, well, I do, because... Kushimaya. But he's a ve- he has a very pretty outfit, is what I want to say. He has got he a very slays. pretty outfit. Um, and Ultimo Dragon. It, it's a shame because basically every luchador has a dragon motif now. Like Drago, obviously, and Phoenix and Kalisto. Fucking Kalisto. But yeah, Ultimo Dragon, especially over time, would look amazing. And don't forget, he was the trendsetter for this as well. Yeah, no. Exactly. <laughs> this match was a submission masterclass yeah um i mean so it's not it's like a pro, it had everything that's good about junior wrestling within it and to have this i also picked this match because it made my top five liger matches that i put up early in the year and um when we did the old wrestling classic i showed you guys um liger and sasuke and you weren't all that enamored with it like you liked it but you weren't enamored no, the, um, the issue I had with the Liger Sasuke match from '94 was that I thought Sasuke was very botchy. Um, I thought Liger certainly was a lot more controlled, shall we say? Yeah, li- this Liger match, was also however, a bit of a dick in that match. <laughs> yeah, this match I thought both men 
had great chemistry together. I thought that even the big spots, you know, the dives from the outside, the cannonballs into Liger and Liger's, you know, returning the favour to Ultimo Dragon. And, you know, you've got the Liger bomb, the absolutely thunderous Liger bomb, was, which Ultimo Dragon kicks out of. And it was right after... Um, it was right after some sort of high risk attempt, which made it even. But you know what this was, Rob? This was a fire pro match because it built. It did build, and I just found it very, very strange that after all this build, all these high spots, you went from the submission opening, the quick mat wrestling, the grappling. You oh, know that, that really, that was a great really pretty. Spot. Like it was a very, it's a very, Lucha spot that gets done basically every junior match now. But like where they do the drop down and then he does the flip over, and then man, like at, right after that. When the crowd still clapping, Liger just sort of kicks the, kicks the fuck out of um, Ultimo's stomach and just cuts it off. I loved it. <laughs> no, you're not getting this. You don't deserve it. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. The, we had all that pretty submission stuff and all the pretty exchanges and the um, lucha bits. Then in the I middle, do like it. it escalated. Mm-hmm. And, and then, like, go on. Ultimo was clearly slower after Liger kept drop kicking his fucking knee. At the beginning of the match. The scream of agony made that a lot more realistic for me as well. You ask know, him. Ask him. Yeah, we we now know that Liger knows at least two words in English. <laughs> in English. Ask him. Actually, no, I know he knows more words in English because I know he can say, finger in my asshole, because thanks to PWG. There you go. <laughs> when when else would you need any other English? Um, <laughs> but yeah, it well, was... in California. <laughs> The drop kicks to the knee were excellent, and Ultimo Dragon sold that knee absolutely amazingly. I know that the, a lot of the problems in modern-day wrestling, especially with modern-day junior wrestling, is that injuries aren't sold throughout matches. This was that's, a perfect example of when it is. That's why Alistair Black and Tommaso Ciampa was such a standout from earlier in this year, because NXT matches don't normally have selling. It's why Walter matches are so um, stand out so much, because... People sell in multi matches, and if you don't, Walter will make sure you're fucking selling by the end. Yeah, exactly. You will sell. <laughs> do it. Um, and then we got to the end where it was just at a f- just this ridiculously frantic pace. Those, those handspring, like people seem to think that the handspring shit started with Osprey. No, fucking the handsprings that Ultimo did, especially since um, because I know Mu also did them. But the thing is with especially with the corner one that Ultimo did, it was the most perfectly timed one I've ever seen because normally you see people have to take a couple steps back. Ultimo has his trajectory well, very fucking well planned out because he just went right elbow in. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you never see that. And then also the one where not fly out the ring before the dives. That was... But just so pr- Ultimo just does such pretty things. You mentioned Osprey earlier. There was a lot of, there was a lot of um, inspiration, shall we say, for Osprey's move set in what Ultimo Dragon was doing, mm-hmm. um, and you can certainly see the inspiration that Osprey has taken. And he he has openly said that you know he, a lot of his move set is taken from that sort of wrestling and Ultimo Dragon and things like that. Oh yeah, there's all these stories about Osprey going to like WrestleGate shows when they came to the UK. Not WrestleGate, that's a different thing. Dragon Gate. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> Um, well, his first company was Lucha Britannica, am I right in thinking that? Yeah, um, which is, yeah, because they were meant, actually, they were meant, I was watching this special on Progress on Demand, which I'll have to give you my login if you want to give it a watch. It's about the Osprey and Havoc rivalry. And Osprey was like, I accidentally bust Jimmy Havoc open once, and I think that's why he tortured me so much throughout our fucking, <laughs> throughout our time in Progress. <laughs> Probably. Actually, After all these story, moves, sorry. Chris... After yeah. all these moves, did you find it a bit underwhelming that it ended with a roll-up? Mm, um, I think that's the only reason it's not a 10 for me. Is Because also, it wasn't... It was, so basically, um, Liger went for a superplex. Um, Ultimo sort of just chucked him out of it. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't any kind of reversal. It was literally, I'm going <laughs> to throw like, you from the top rope. It's like, it's like a, a, a spot in the Stan Hansen match, assuming you got that bit, where uh, Kabaki was doing the shot from him and Hansen just shoved him away. It's kind of like that, but <laughs> off the top rope. Um, so, landed and then did an Elm, La- I, what's it, an Elm Magical or something. Yeah, um, Magistral. The roll-up. There we go. A brute to roll up and then tried it again and then like you just sort of did the fire pro reversal to win. 
Um, a bit, but also I think because it's a cross promotion um, cup, you need to keep finishes a bit diplomatic. Okay. Like, but was it because Liga was? Oh, no, Ultimo was was guy, wasn't he? Uh, at this point, Ultimo was yeah, was guy. So like, Liga's going over two war guys to win this champion to win this J Cup, and Ultimo is probably war's biggest guy, I think. So, but he probably this probably was a diplomatic ending to not. Go, oh, New Japan's guy is unequivocally better than World Guy. It was sort of like, oh, he got through by the skin of his teeth. Next time, oh, next time. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, at this point, Ultimo Dragon was the WAR International Junior Heavyweight Champion, and he was also Beta. the NWA World Middleweight Champion. And so, next year, wouldn't he be the J Crown winner? Uh, I couldn't that's, tell you. Because that's how he got all his fucking. Both pic- that picture of um, Ultimo with like a million belts. That's the J Crown. One sec. J Crown. Keep talking. About what? I don't, I don't know, Rob. You're <laughs> no, the, I'm you're the fucking. I'm, I'm, not even fucking, I'm only the fucking co host. <laughs> all right? So, overall, then, Chris, you said it wasn't quite a 10. What is no, it for I, you, then? I think it's a 9, especially when you're given the time period. I think it's a 9. So, we oh, give all way, three we of these matches the 9. J- Yes, but also very quickly. Um, in the tournament to crown the J Crown, um, which was was next, yeah, was the next year. Um, <laughs> Ultimo Dragon beat Liger in two and a half minutes. So, oh, okay, so at least he got his revenge. Yeah, um, and then Sasuke beat him in the um, finals. But anyway, yeah, because all of these are the slight. I think if I was watching at the time, all of these would be a ten, especially the. Hanson, Kibashi. To be fair, I'm airing on the side of 10, but also it really, that match really scares me. Yeah, I think everything from 90s All Japan is sort of scary. Um, oh, fucking... Especially the burning hammers. Like, you think... Like, I'm, I don't want to sound like an old fan, because I'm not. I mean, very young fan, but, like, the, the, the art of both the burning hammer and the emerald explosion is kind of lost. Uh, yeah, certainly. I will just say that this match... Sorry, the Hanson... Um, Kabashi match. It was not the main event. The main event was Masawa versus Kawada for the. Is that the really? No, no, no. That was in '96 or something. Like the one that Mountain gave six stars. Yeah, no, it wasn't that one. It got four and a quarter. But, but it are, but outshone of, that one. But all of Masawa and Kawada's matches are great. I'm gonna have to show you one. But that's the problem is I couldn't show you any of like of Trumba Pillars, like Tawe Kawada. Masawa and Kabashi because they're all a fucking hour long and I know you don't have the time I don't have the time to sit and watch one of your fucking Valkyrie rock operas no I don't <laughs> <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen that is our review done we've reviewed the three matches we've given you our thoughts on them please go out of your way to go and check them out if you can go and find the right Kenta Kabashi versus Dan Hanson match that would be great but I mean, as we've proved they pretty much had the same formula for all their 1993 <laughs> matches especially the summer action series in 1993 so please go and check those out in the meantime Go and check out the Podmania Pro Wrestling Podcast, the other podcast we do. It's on the same feed. Subscribe. You can check us out on all podcasting platforms. You can check us out on Facebook, on Twitter. You can check us out on Podmania on Twitter. Uh, you can follow, follow me at, at Real Rob Goodwin. Chris, where can they find you? At Candy Chris 97 and Tinder. <laughs> ladies he's single um <laughs> saturday is when the podmania podcast goes up at 11 a.m gmt on mondays our universe mode goes live a new episode every monday at 7 p.m i think that's everything chris have i plugged everything i think so but also if you want i do have your choices for next time really all five of them yeah yeah, because I'm carrying a couple over that you didn't pick from this time. Okay, go for it before we end. Right, so we have Okada and Nakamura for the G1 Finals in 2015, I believe. Okay. Um, I'm going to throw on the six-star Kawada and Masao. You don't need to take it if you don't need to. I'm just doing it because we have a bit of time before the next one of these. Okay. Um, Ajikong versus Manami Toyota at Big Egg Wrestling Universe. Okay. 
um, Suzuki, um, no, Kota Ibushi versus the Blow Up Doll. Great. And also, um, Stan Hansen versus Vader, where Vader gets his like knocked out. Okay, that sounds interesting. Actually, it's an interesting bunch. One of them is another Stan Hansen match, an even scarier Stan Hansen match. And yeah, I kind of just going to keep putting in the Abushi versus Blow Up Doll until you fucking pick it. And I'm going to keep not picking it so that you have to put it it's in gonna, the next it's one. Gonna be, it's going to be a running thing. And then when it's my birthday, you're going to review it for me. One day. One day. Thank you so much for listening, guys. Make sure to check out the Young Lioncast and Podmania, and we'll talk to you guys again soon. Bye.